Marhaba I am honoured to welcome you to this thought-provoking panel discussion and on a topic of paramount importance in our ever-changing world, the world in transition, conflict mediation and global alliances post-COVID. The past few years have brought unprecedented challenges to nations and individuals alike. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed vulnerabilities, highlighted uncertainties and amplified fragilities across the world. In this context, the need for an ever-effective conflict mediation and the de development of new global alliances has never been more crucial. We now have two active wars, Ukraine and Russia and Israel and Palestine. But let's take a moment and reflect on the cost of Russia and Ukraine war. US officials told US Today, New York Times, that it estimates the cost of life between Ukrainian and Russian soldiers is in context over 500,000 lives lost. Civilian lives is around 9,600. Russia has already spent 160 million billion, sorry, on the war. And the US has given so far 75 billion and have committed that they will give up to 130 billion. However, there's two nations that stand out as mediation conflict, mediators in the world of conflict. And that is China and Turkey. Today we have assembled a distinguished panel of experts who will shed light on these complex issues. We will explore how nations including Turkey are well placed to mediate conflicts and build new alliances and how these efforts can promote positive change across microeconomics and geopolitical dimensions. Our discussion will also incorporate the role of BRICS nations, which includes Brazil, Russia, India and South Africa. These emerging powers have the potential to reshape the global order and we will examine their influence, how it can be harnessed for the greater good, particularly in conflict resolution and peace building efforts. At the end of our discussion, I encourage all of you to be involved and do a Q&A. So we, our panel would love to answer your questions and we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. We thank our esteemed panellists for their expertise and time and we extend our gratitude to you for being here today. Let's embark on a journey together as we strive to make this world a better place. Now I'm going to introduce our esteemed panel. We have Minister Sefe Holland, who has come from Zimbabwe. She is the chairperson and board of trustees for Zimbabwe Peace Building Initiative, former Minister of State for National Healing, Reconciliation and Integration in Zimbabwe. She is a Zimbabwe former politician who served not only as minister, but on 30th of April 2012, she was honoured to be the 15th recipient of the Sydney Peace Prize Award. She has a lifetime of outstanding courage in campaigning for human rights, democracy, for challenging violence in all of its forms, and I congratulate her for her brave leadership and empowerment of women. I have Samendra Mohan Kumar. He is a co-founder and managing director of Midcat Advisory. Samendra is also an ex-army man. He is a distinguished veteran and he has also won the Sword of Honour and the President's Gold Medal at the Indian Military Academy. An expert in geopolitics, he advises the largest multinationals globally on geopolitics and security and risk management. Mr. Mehmet Istan Kalkan, president of Escado Group, Turkey, a businessman and owner of Mate Football Club. Also, he has a professional football team based in Uganda. He has a professional background in international law and migration. A member of Global Peace and Africa Asian Association in Turkey. Escudo Group provides humanitarian aid, products, services and assistance to refugees and asylum seekers internationally. Operating globally in Turkey, Turkey, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Pakistan, India and China. I'd like to welcome Ms. Sebel Yildirim. She's the Chief Executive Officer of Tashkilat Group Turkey. 
She's a well-experienced CEO and independent board member from various industries, as well as in the field of finance. She's been called one of the strongest 20 businesswomen in Turkey in August 2020. She's also the executive, chance, uh, executive vice chairperson of Foreign Economic Affairs. She helps dealing with Russia Business Council, Canadian Business Council, and she's on the board of directors of the Association of Turkey. Ms. Nogomita from Japan. She's representing the Boston Global Forum in Japan. Ms. Nobia is a graduate from the Department of French Literature at Rikiri University. She's worked previously for Jitsu, a Mitsubishi company, and in 2011, she organized a charity concert for the Great East Japan Earthquake with a former Japanese ambassador to the United States. And last but not least, Dr. Asif Iqbal. He is the president of the Indian Economic Trade Organization. He has over 10 years' experience in engaging political, business, culture, and corporate leaders to shape regional and industrial agendas. He also served as honorary counsel for the Republic of Suriname. uncertain and fragile world. Which nation would you suggest is best suited to deal and mediate between Russia and Ukraine? Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, apologies to the Horasis. This is my fifth Horasis conference and uh, it's really glad that we are there in Gaziantep uh, in a discussing on this issue of uh, what's best uh, for peace, especially in the current geopolitical outlook that you're all facing. Of course, we're not discussing that directly, which is a good thing because we have different sides. However, coming from India, and uh, India recently concluding our G20, uh, and when we made the Delhi Declaration, it was very clear that how, uh, you know, over the years, uh, we have been maintaining, uh, you know, situation and conditions uh, that are not completely to, you know, split the world and uh, to attempt to expand military alliances you know, to seek absolute security. This is something that's the quality that is needed. Uh, countries like Sweden, Switzerland uh, are leading in being very neutral. Of course, we also have Austria and Luxembourg in the smaller ones. Uh, but if you look at the larger ones that are able, uh, you know, to be able, you know, uh, to be completely neutral and to understand the peace and to be non-aligned. India has always maintained its non-aligned status uh, right from when they signed uh, the NAM. And since then, they have decided not to be aligning with anybody, but at the same time keep their stand. Because being non-aligned gives you this flexible, uh, fluid condition of wanting and being able to be there with whomever is you know, necessary and you need to be with either of them. India, we have an embassy in uh, Israel. We have a representation office in uh, Palestine. We have an uh, embassy in Iran. We have an embassy in Venezuela. We have embassies in the United States. So we have a very good diplomatic presence that is really taking care of a non-aligned, uh, you know, status, and at the same time being able, uh, you know, to, uh, to to give this necessary support that is needed for everybody. Because you know, looking at different perspectives is very important for any country, uh, you know, to maintain peace and to also advocate peace. Uh, so we have made it very clear that uh, you know we are not standing with anybody, but at the same time we stand with everybody. So I think that is the first point that is needed because that gives you the space for you to welcome and absorb the you know inputs and perspectives from both sides, and that's what is needed for anyone. Be non-aligned. Do you feel India will take a stance and put themselves forward to mediate? Yes, India has uh, been uh, passing through a very difficult phase when they were uh, you know asked uh, by certain countries in the West when they did not say anything about Russia's war with Ukraine. Uh, but then our, uh, you know, our foreign minister and our uh, and the government made very clear that uh, they are interested in the needs of their people first than looking at the geopolitical, you know, uh, thing. So I think the first uh, preference is to be given to the people of their own country and then look at the global outlook. 
So, and Indian people also, you know, they are very much there supporting and being there at the same time. Sanam, if I may. Now you have a military background. So I think it's quite interesting to get your insight. Now, do you feel Turkey is best positioned to mediate between this war? And do you feel also Turkey can make its efforts to bring peace in the Middle East with what is going on? They have done excellent efforts in the last week um, with trying to mediate and speak, spoken to most of the world's economic powers to bring peace. They've done abundance of aid going straight over to the Palestinian um, people as well. Um, Turkey has had a long standing relationship with Israel. At one point, it, many years ago, it was called Israel's only Muslim friend. So, what's your thoughts? So, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, but, uh, you know, coming from so far, and here everybody has a view on, and over the last two days, I have tried to, you know, a certain views of people. And everybody has a very, very strong view, you know, on, on this. And everybody seems to be knowledgeable here. So for me, it would be like, you know, unfair to kind of decide or make a judgment. But I'll also try to answer the question without evading it since you've asked me a question. So, so firstly, the views are mine. So they don't represent either view of India or of my company. So, so just the usual disclaimer. And so yeah, Turkey has the potential. Two countries, in fact, in this region have potential, Egypt and Turkey. And why I believe Turkey is better poised? Because, you know, let's take Egypt. Firstly, it itself has a border with Gaza. And it's one of the crossings is involved and it will remain a border of contention as long as the... Your lot depends on that, you know. And it has got an election coming up next year. So political compulsions often in democracies decide, you know, what you do and what you don't do. Turkey, as you said, has got great relationships with both Israel and, and, and Palestine, of course, and of course, and the, the popular support remains for Palestine remains very, very deep here. As you walk these streets, it's, it's very evident here. The, the problem that I see is that there is some amount of trust deficit which is bring, building up with NATO because of the growing proximity, as seen by Western eyes, rightly or wrongly, with, with Russia. And it's, the US sees it a bit tilted towards Russia. So that may complicate matters. So some amount of it could have some amount of trust deficit with EU and, and NATO may be a concern, uh, but it is definitely one of the front runners. A good point about Turkey is that it has had elections, so no elections coming up immediately. Uh, it has a great precedent, who is, so you need credible global leaders, leaders of, with great regional and global standing, and we have a president here who is, has a great global reputation. So you need people who can stick their neck out, and so he, he tried his level best in Russia, in Russia-Ukraine war. So I think uh, the you know with a great president at the helm who would like to leave a legacy, I think Turkey is very well poised to among, among all the nations. There are no easy solutions. You talk to a guy, they will tell you here, you know, go to 1967, that will solve matters, somebody will give you some other things. If it was that easy, it would have been solved. But having said that, keeping all the facts in mind, I think Turkey under a very strong uh, president who would be happy to leave a legacy, you know, for times to come give a great gift before he hangs up his boots and with no elections coming in you know the next few years would be in a good position to you know and enjoying credibility for both sides would be in a good position to make it i fully agree i think turkey has shown they have great relations with all nations and they have put themselves at the forefront each and every time minister holland now you're a former minister um, from Zimbabwe, and obviously when Zimbabwe has had political tensions in the past as well. Could you explain to us post-COVID, or what, what has your country learnt post-COVID? Um, thank you very much um, for this opportunity to be in Turkey at this time. Um, I really want to thank Frank, if you could convey those uh, thanks from me. I, I don't think many people know that Zimbabwe is on sanctions and has been on sanctions for more than 25 years. Uh, we are thrown out of the, no we are not, the Commonwealth, we are not members. And big rules have been made to make it impossible for us to come in. I'm not crybabying, but I just want you to see the context to what I'm going to say. Um, we therefore, if the British knew we were here, I think they'd quite be shocked Turkey would invite against their wishes that we are sanctioned. 
But um, I'm also praying to return to take us back. Um, I'll send the message. COVID, when it came, all the Western scholars, researchers told us Africa would be wiped out. When those things come, truly we believe them. And all of us made preparations for a continent that would be empty. I mean that. What shocked us uh, as the months went by was that the people in the rural areas had no debts. So each one of us, every Zimbabwean, it doesn't matter how sophisticated they look, has got roots in the rural areas. And when critical times like marriage, like uh, death, like you have to go back to those rural people because without their blessing, nothing we do is going to be successful because they're the ones who are connected to the land, to the water, to the air, where our spiritual ancestors live. So we all rushed back to the rural areas and we found them thriving. And they were surprised when we were talking about COVID. So we said, so what are you doing? They said, what do you mean? We do what we always do. The nutrition was the herbs which they always had, the grains that they always had. So all of us realized junk food out, city food out, and we went back to our traditional meals. There also was another angle that they introduced us to. It was herbs that prevent ailments. And one of them, which I actually never tried, I wasn't brave enough. You boil the leaves, you cover yourself with a heavy blanket, and you inhale for 30 minutes. I thought I would die under the blanket, so I didn't try it. But everybody, when they got up, that's what they did. When they went to sleep, that's what they did. I was at that time 75 years old. And I think they attacked my COVID. Neither did my husband, who is Australian. He went to Australia to a wedding. And I told him, wear a mask. He said, oh, but we are OK. We had three jabs, and we are eating well, and I'm getting my tea with me to Australia. Well, he got COVID at the wedding. As soon as he got well, he flew back to Zimbabwe, where he thought he would survive <laughs> if he stayed. Anyway, so COVID made us respect our traditional nutritional habits and our medicinal habits. And uh, we realized that really what the way we had been raised was very good. And we've gone back to that. So really, the scholars who were predicting us to be wiped out, I haven't seen them coming to study why we are still alive. <laughs> and we are here in Turkey. No, seriously. I invite people who are doing herbal medicine, and I'm, I'm going to a spice tour on Wednesday. I really would like to see the Turkish, um, the food is incredible. I'm doing nothing but eating here. Um, the herbs. I really would like to take some of them back to Zimbabwe. We have 51 in our garden now, and I'd like to take some more in exchange with the spice. You've made an interesting point that Zimbabwe has been under sanctions for 25 years. From the British, our, and we are under sanctions. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's from the British. Um, now, Russia is under sanctions. Do you think sanctions work? No, it hasn't no, stopped Zimbabwe. Here I am. Here I am. They don't work. <laughs> Turkey invited me, here I am. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. But inside the country, they are devastating. When you, you, you meet as Zimbabweans, yeah, I mean, you, traditionally, you don't expose your poverty. It's taboo. But you just know what you're experiencing, the others experience. There's no cash. Because we have no access to IMF, we have no access to any bilateral support. Our government has no access to borrowing. So now, the tragedy, see, I'm making an appeal now. Uh, we managed to get the Commonwealth Observer Mission to come to Zimbabwe for these elections. And they were sent to remote areas to really see how the voting was done. I think everyone was Ian Smith. Uh, who ran the uh, country as Rhodesia, UDI, 
His slogan for elections was for a whiter, brighter Rhodesia. Vote Rhodesia France. This is in Africa. And uh, he was serious. And they introduced some of the most brutal laws against the Africans. Okay, with a brutal liberation war and a very brutal one. Then um, we came home, and our president, Mugabe, his election slogan was I have degrees in violence. Anyone who disagrees with my policy, start your own party. So 42 NGOs got together, and we started. Uh, the movement for democratic change. And we really pushed the government and the ruling party to come out at its worst in terms of that there's nothing nice that you get when you're being nice to each other. So uh, in 2007, we did the church led campaign praying that Mugabe finally be called by God to heaven because really he had done very well and we thought he had excessively done what was bad. We were told we would be beaten up and tortured for this, because we knew that's why we were doing this. We were brutally tortured very badly on the 11th of March in uh, 2007. And what was good about the torture was that a year after like, I got well, I was sent to Sydney for treatment, because my whole body was totally bundled. We were sent, uh, after a year, I came back, well, I was brought back by my husband. I, I really didn't want to come. So I was brought back to continue the struggle in an inclusive government where I was made the minister at my um, request for that ministry for national healing, reconciliation, and integration. After every fight in every civilization, a white flag comes up and people say peace, and people sit down and talk. And that's what I'd really like to talk about, take it to your question. You know, you, you made a very interesting point um, about sanctions which crippled the country financially. Yeah. And that's why there's a growing trend where obviously Russia is crippled by you know, not being able to use SWIFT. But it, certain countries in Asia, not naming any, uh, they're not, their payment system is actually on an app. It's not dependent on any master visa or SWIFT, so they, you know, are free from sanctions. And that's a growing trend that's starting to happen globally. Now, I'm, I'm going to go to Nobu. Hello, welcome from Japan. Um, now, Nobu has prepared a five minute speech. She won't be joining in all the questions, but she has a special speech for us to give us a perspective from Japan. Um, now, what is important to resolve? the world divisions from a Japanese point of view. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to have opportunity to make speech at uh, such a wonderful uh, honorable Horace conference in Turkey, uh, Gaziantep. Thank you very much. And I am Nobu Emita, the representative of Boston Global Forum Japan. Harvard prominent professors are our main members. I am uh, established BGF Japan 10 years ago. I gathered a great Japanese intellectual and con connected to Harvard people. And we gathered from all over the world by online. Please join. <laughs> Uh, Japan and uh, I think uh, division in the world, uh, I'd like to talk about the division uh, in the world. And Japan and Turkey have had close relationship uh, historically. In 1890, a Turkish warship El Tulu was lost in typhoon in Wakayama Prefecture in Japan. We Japanese people are devotedly rescued and care for them. They risk their life to uh, help. 600 Turks has died, unfortunately. Miraculously, 69 people survived 
and return to Turkey by Japanese ship. It's uh, 100 years ago. During the Iran-Iraq War, 1985, 215 Japanese people were strained at an Iranian airport. Uh, they uh, were helpless, hopeless. But uh, suddenly, Turkish aircraft uh, appeared and delivered them safely to Japan, uh, despite the risks. The Turkish ambassador to Japan explained the reason later. Uh, we simply repay the debt of El Tur in AD 90. Thank you so much. The story of El Tur shipwreck and Japanese rescue has been included uh, in Turkish textbook for a long time so far. Not now, social division is serious problem in the world. This is little known fact. Japan is the first country in history to propose to international community at the historical Paris Peace Conference uh, just after World War, World War, War I in 1919. Uh, Japan, uh, uh, Japan proposed to international community for elimination of discrimination at the historical Paris Peace Conference uh, just after World War I in 1990. The important thing is that each country and each ethnic group must protect its own history and culture. If do not continue to cherish these values, peace in global society will never be achieved. Late Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, a great leader of Japan and the world, uh, he contributed uh, world peace uh, connected the world. Amidst the current instability in the world, Japan would like to unite and help each other with countries that value freedom and democracy and want to help each other. I believe that the spirit of helping each other, like Japan and the Turkey, is the key to world peace in the future. Japan has created its own deep values. At the beginning of the 7th century, a very old year, a Japanese priest Shotoku promulgated a 17th article constitution. It's written that people in high positions should respect those below. The emperor of 19th century as well valued people in his constitution. Japanese people have valued people since ancient times. I think this spirit will lead to a solution to the division in the world now. It may not be easy, but uh, ultimately, it's a person-to-person -person issue. I think we can overcome it by thinking positively, which is the way of thinking of Horaris to Horaces too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. That was a wonderful example you shared of the friendship of two nations. Thank you, Mehmet. Now, you're obviously, you know, you do humanitarian work across the world and you're an organisation, so I want to pose a question to you. In what ways can international organisations or alliances support and enable conflict mediation efforts by nations facing these eternal issues?
thanks Ms. Farah. Uh, I am glad to be part of global meeting by Oasis organization in the most cultural, historical city in Gaziantep. So really, is a, according to me, especially in this time, it is a very important place where leaders, ministers, CEOs, businessmen from many countries they are coming in this point city on the world. Like finance, technology, and uh, different or for investment come together. We are all here to discuss two big ideas that can change the world. Mahatma Gandhi said, build to change, you want see in the world. And also, also Nelson Mandela said, the most powerful weapon you can use the change, the world is education. Now, really, when we check our historical life and the past life, and we start in 1991, World War. We start with this war, unfortunately, when we was in the high school. And the first time we see the refugees in our country, and that time in South Korea. And we understand the, what is the reason about the war, what has happened with people, how damaged they like, how they lost their family and children. And also, I was working four years in the United Nations International Organization for Migration. We did two projects. What was that? One was family reunification program, and another one was voluntary return program. The family reunification program means who lost their family in the war time, and they didn't see each other, and they lost everything, home, materials, and father, and mother, and huge family. So, we start with this part, and now we came another part, we see start the Syria war now. And this is really terrible, like war and Syria is in the war together. They are against us and they are fighting uh, for, we don't understand now, very clearly. And now we come all time, you see the Russia-Ukraine war. And of the day, Israel Palestine war. Really, this is not acceptable. War have to check again and say, what is this? Where we are going? After COVID, we work together, we try best from all part, or we can cooperate from different countries. We send some items, they send to all country. This is the means global war. This was good cooperation for war. There was also bad uh, experience, but anyway, there was good experience. But as you know now, uh, for United Nations, and like international organization, I can say, if you see the statistic, there is no success of any war that can stop it. In, in the war, there is f uh, five, uh, five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Always they block the peace on the war. Who is this? French, uh, Russia, China, United Kingdom, USA. Why? We have to ask some question. If we accept everything on this world, why we are here? If we cannot change something, or we cannot fight, we cannot cooperate, and we cannot show the world, we are together, we need peace. War is not uh, help any people. War is damage everything on the world. Not only their country, the refugees coming, this is another also big problem on the world. The poverty problem, economic problem, social economic right problem, all is coming together. And that part, United Nations, I think mission is completed for United Nations on the world. We need new, uh, effective, as really work for world peace, and they can take some decision, and they can give some punishment for some, which country doesn't matter. They can stop it. Otherwise, nobody can stop these wars always will coming like that. And only we will sit at home and we watch in television. But don't forget, one day 
maybe at your home will start something from it. For that, uh, according to me, I was working for the United Nations. Okay, they are doing good projects, they are working for something, but, but they are so slow and of course uh, for work they have to work more and for all areas. And usually in Middle East and uh, the another areas where there is problem in Ukraine, uh, we are working now in humanitarian aid and the development projects with United Nations in different countries. And we see everything is very clearly. And people, they are really under very bad conditions. They can not find one bread. Sometimes they cannot find one blanket. And sometimes they can not find for home civic matrices. We have to think about that again. And how in all the world people, uh, some people they win big, big, huge money, and some people they cannot buy bread or they need one bread. This is my another question. Uh, the reason thing, uh, I want to say uh, these things after uh, all this experience, uh, because also I'm an uh, international lawyer, for that we have to fight more for human rights, for democracy, for high standard social economic rights for all the world. Because now we have one world and we know we are citizens of world. There is no border for this now. Uh, you can understand from this salon very easy, very clearly. From many countries we are together. We are together, we discuss some things, how we can cooperate, how we can develop the business, how we can develop all social parts, and how we can make, we can do, need a great, peaceful world. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And and that's exactly why we depend on organisations like yourself because, as you are correct, the political response can be slow. But what your organisations do, you provide disaster relief immediately and displacement to refugees. So again, we congratulate you for all the hard efforts that you do. Seth Dilhanna. Now, you're one of Turkey's most influential women in business. And I want your insights. Um, what unique insights or advantages does Turkey have in mediating the Russian-Ukraine conflict, given its cross historical culture and geopolitical ties with both regions? Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, and uh, welcome to all, uh, to our great country, Turkey. I mean, I, uh, I enjoy that uh, many uh, friends, many visitors coming from uh, different parts of the world. And I, I would like to uh, congratulate, first of all, and thank you to Forasis, because uh, it is so meaningful as well, uh, distinguished guests and distinguished panelists. Today we are uh, discussing uh, the future of the world and the sustainability of the world in a, in a sense. Uh, and uh, as my uh, friend uh, asked uh, some severe questions, in fact, what I see, the world is on the uh, uh, critical edge in terms of sustainability, not only for uh, due, to, due to the fact that the, experience, the problems experienced during the pandemic or COVID, but also because of the sustainability of the human uh, and the societies, the peace uh, in uh, Middle East, but the whole world. Why? Uh, why it is so critical this time? This time, I think, uh, of, of course, we don't want to pump the negative aspects or increase the neg negativism, but uh, for a month uh, to bring solutions, uh, we should first understand how severe is the situation uh, and why uh, Turkey is better positioned to better understand the uh, severity of the situation and how to uh, overcome these uh, bottlenecks. Uh, as we all know, you know the, especially uh, after the pandemic, the, all human beings, we realize that you know, the, it is extremely easy uh, to uh, erase the human uh, uh, from the earth, from the surface of the earth, with just one tiny virus. We all experienced that. So after that, uh, we had a great hope uh, for the future collaboration, future cooperation, 
for a better, peaceful uh, world to live together. Why Horace uh, made a distinctive effort uh, by coming to uh, Gaziantep to hold this uh, wonderful, uh, high intellectual meeting? Because, uh, as you know that, if you change your perspective, if you change your angle, the reality shifts. So the definition of reality changes. And as Her Excellency defined her experience, uh, we know that you know, the, uh, the world problems or regional problems might have different realities or different, they might appear as the expression of different realities if you look from this different perspective. But we must all understand very well that, and after the pandemic, we should, the, the human being must have understood already, but apparently it's not. Uh, we are all extremely well interconnected. So a person at the other edge of the world cannot feel safe, unfortunately, really unfortunately, because I have my beloveds also at the other edge of the world. But nobody can feel safe anymore after this huge interconnectivity if uh, people are dying in the Middle East, uh, no matter the, the root cause it is. So, uh, there is no luxury, period. There is no luxury that no one can sleep very well if we bring the real solutions to the Middle East problem, because why it is so, why it this time is quite uh, different, because there are finite and infinite wars. For instance, you know, the Turkey is celebrating the 100th uh, anniversary of Turkish Republic. It was a finite war, because why? Uh, there were many nations coming from different parts of the world, I, I don't want to uh, name it, but the enemies, they came and we fought for that, with a huge uh, belief and with a huge uh, effort, and we won. Uh, it was a very, uh, how can I say, uh, it was a very big story uh, in terms of salvation story of the nation. But the problem of the, uh, sorry, I came to Middle Eastern situation, but there are uh, problematic situations like Ukraine, Russia, or Palestine or uh, Israel. Uh, the problem is that, you know, the, both of them, they are living in their home country. Both of them, they, they, are, they don't have any other space to go. Coming back to uh, Ukraine and Russia, I think, uh, I'm a business person, but I used to work for the Turkish uh, government many years ago, and I am also part of many NGOs, international, national, but uh, what I realize is that if you don't change the, uh, the functioning of the decision making, no matter if, uh, you can, you, or how far you talk, doesn't matter. Unfortunately, this is the case. You need to change decision making uh, bodies. You need to change how they approach the uh, problems. So, uh, coming back to uh, Turkey's role, I think uh, Turkey had made a sincere effort to keep the balance in between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, I mean, it was it, it had to do that because uh, because they, they are both, both of them they are our neighbors, both Ukraine and Russia, and we have many historical ties with them. We have marriages. They are tourists in our home country, in, in our country, both of them. And even they go to the same hotels even after the war. In the same hotel, you can see in Antalya both Ukrainians and Russian people next to each other even after the war. I mean, so we are uh, in, in between. Uh, we are quite close to uh, each other. So Turkey had to follow the balance uh, policy, as we call it in Turk Turkish. Uh, I think, uh, honestly, I'm not a politician.
position right now, uh, but as a business person, uh, I really appreciate that because somebody must have been behaving cool, uh, must have been uh, cool, because it's a very problematic region of the world. You know, the, if you look at the old neighbors of Turkey, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, problem is everywhere. And we need the work, we do the business, we do the exports, we do the investments, uh, we do everything as if there isn't any problem around us. So, uh, but we try to be uh, as much as uh, uh, cool in the sense of uh, uh, definition of some uh, policies in diplomacy as we did the green corridor in between uh, among uh, Ukraine and the rest of the world, because not only the, the peacekeeping effort in the region, but also sustainability of the food supply to the rest of the world, and sustainability of the Ukrainian and Russian uh, economies altogether. So we'll come back to that point, actually. Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, so uh, I think uh, Turkey is well positioned. With Coming back to your uh, question, I really appreciate Horace's, believe me, uh, because it's a big uh, brain effort to come to Gaziantep, and by the way, it is uh, a, a, a, a one of the epicenters uh, for the earthquake early this year, and we really appreciate our uh, helpers from Japan, from other international committee from everywhere, from Greece. I think this is the uh, panoramic view that we should be gaining afterwards, after the, uh, the COVID-19, actually. So, I would like to also refer to United Nations. Can we come back to that? Okay. Thank you so much. We'll definitely come back to that. Now, I want to ask Dr. Bon and Sam about BRICS. Now, India is a key member. So India is a key member of BRICS, and Turkey has expressed its interest to build close economic ties with BRICS. Now, how do you see that relationship building, and do you see BRICS playing a greater role in the future for mediation in wars? Uh, BRICS has been a very, uh, you know, um, a very close cooperation, unlike other uh, several countries, you know, aiming to split and attempt to expand their alliances. The BRIC cooperation focuses on injecting new impetus into maintaining the world peace and promoting the common development. And they have demonstrated this kind of resilience by embracing the spirit of openness, inclusiveness, and win-win cooperation. Now, the BRICs resist the Cold War mentality and the block confrontation. It opposes the hegemonian and power politics. And that is one good reason why BRICs could be committed to multilateralism, oppose the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. And there is a complete mutual respect, fairness, justice, and women cooperation that the BRICS has. Recently, they also have uh, the UAE uh, in the last summit. They also admitted uh, BRICS, uh, UAE, and Ethiopia, and Argentina, all three entered. So this uh, whole thing is expanding, and now the BRICS is also looking at a common currency, which is another, uh, you know, product. Uh, well, what is a financial product? Yes, that's that's the overall. Uh, there. And then uh, we have a currency that is uh, going to be aimed at, which is going to be a parallel to the SWIFT system. So uh, we, are, we are working towards that and I think we are reaching there because Russia has sanctions and uh, India and Russia, we already have created a ruby ruby you know, connectivity, uh, which has made things easier for trade between the Indian and Russian companies. So BRICS is a uh, you know, great platform for uh, you know, getting into this thing and trying to adapt some kind of resolutions. Apart from that, India is also uh, on platforms like the I2U2 platform, which is a very appropriate platform where they have the UAE, U Israel, United States, and India. So that gives a leeway for them to converse, to uh, you know, kind of collaborate and use countries like the UAE and Israel sitting on one platform and talking together. So I suppose that BRICS is uh, another institution and this is the time for multilateral arrangements and multilateral platforms like this uh, for solutions. So single countries cannot and uh, will not be able to uh, you know, do anything individually because of technology being there 
and technology has brought all of us together. And uh, it is uh, really imperative that these multilateral organizations, multilateralism, will uh, be a great solution uh, for these kind of problems. So as Turkish Republic celebrates its 100 years, and congratulations for that. And as I personally see, and many of us who have come from around the world, we see the resilience, the reconstruction of the people, and I would like to compliment you. And as Turkey remains a force for good, trying to build peace between Russia and Ukraine, and between Israel and Palestine, and doing it stupid a bit, having, doing the heavy lifting, and then not kind of, you know, being cowed down by this thing, and having a voice of itself, a partial voice, a voice for neutrality, a voice for reason. Unfortunately, the world around is in a geopolitical recession. What we have is unprecedented. Today we have a hot war going on in Europe. We have another hot war to the other side. You know, we the, the climate change is kind of, we have had the worst summers this year in, in living history and probably throughout history. Uh, the long tail of COVID is still here. We have a growing bipolarity between the US and China. And then, you know, there is one thing in which the, where Democrats and Republicans agree on U.S. is that China presents the existential threat to U.S. and then to the dominance of the U.S. So it must be contained and then we must kind of maintain our, um, you know, lead in tech, tech, particularly in critical technologies. And similarly, on one thing everybody in China agrees is that U.S.'s sole aim is to encircle and contain China, you know, prevent the rise of China and they feel Asia's time has come, China's time has come and, and we should seize the moment. And, and they have drawn their red lines and probably one, one China policy and Taiwan being reddest of the red lines. So just with that broad, you know, broad overall geopolitical context. And then we also have one more thing, that trade protectionism is undermining the global trading system. So what happened is earlier when we fought, we fought countries and defenses, but few people still traded. But now at the slightest of excuse, people say, no, no, all is well, and but we still kind of. And it is even beginning, it's a trend evident in the US, it's a trend evident in Europe and everywhere in the world. So, so things are not great, things are not rosy. And then, so let's look at BRICS now. So what is BRICS? I mean, it was initially BRICS, four countries, and, and Brazil, Russia, India and China, and then South Africa joined in 2012 and has been a major contributor thereafter. So in mean, BRICS, if you look at the leanings of three countries currently, Russia, China and, and Brazil, from a geopolitical perspective, I think they are a little inclined away from the US and that would be an understatement and from the West. So what has been, uh, BRICS has been portrayed by some particularly in the West as more of an anti-US alliance. And, and while uh, with addition of six countries, so last year, I mean this year, a decision has been taken and next year six countries will join BRICS. That is Argentina, will join Brazil from South Africa, South America. It, then we have two countries from Africa, Egypt and Ethiopia, joining South Africa. And we have three countries from Middle East joining, which is UAE, Saudi Arabia and Iran. So it's kind of a, and it will, it's heft in world economy will grow. But as far as Turkey is concerned, the way I see it, I mean, it's a perspective from India, you would probably have your own views. Uh, so what we'll see is that with China, Russia and, uh, and, and Brazil now, under the present president, being seen as NP-West dispensation and, and these three founding members being seen a little bit. I, I think it's joining BRICS will complicate its relations with the NATO and EU. So, so that is my kind of quick, uh, as politically correct as I can be. Very politically correct. Minister Holland, what's your viewpoints on BRICS and obviously we have African nations joining as well? Um, first of all, there's one thing you've left out. <coughs> Now, before I came, I went to see the Turkish ambassador in Zimbabwe. She's one of the most brilliant diplomats in Harare. And she gave us a full briefing on Turk, Turkish, uh, Turkey's role in mediation. Uh, Turkey is a member with uh, Finland inside the United Nations. It's a mediation unit. And I'm sure right now, they are very busy behind the scenes doing a lot of bringing people together. Because of course, Turkey is a member of NATO. And uh, I didn't know that, I found out from my husband today. And that in fact, Turkey is not a member of BRICS, but has very good relations with Western countries. And in particular, it has very good relations with Russia and China. So what it appears like is that with this rolling with Finland, Turkey really does have 
one of the most unique positions in being able to swing some things. But this is what I've found out since I came here, that uh, in fact BRICS, the way it's being molded, finally gets Africa to sit on the table as an equal partner. And for me, for our young people, I really hope wherever they are, because they're scattered in the diaspora, that they are able to really follow these things, because tomorrow belongs to Africa. And we really will depend on that resource from Africa of the young people today. Um, I think that from what I'm reading, having come here and looked at what, well, I don't want people to take me wrongly. When I was flying here, this is important for me coming from Southern Africa. I thought people in Turkey are like very dark. So I was really shocked. <laughs> they are hostesses. They are white. And I thought, so you read all that history, the Ottoman Empire, and we've done your history for the thousands of years it has been. I thought you might have inhaled in, in some other blood. But I thought, God, they're still white. So I think even that in this region um, is a very important thing because of the language, the food, and the rich you have where Gaza, Egypt, those places are. Um, and I really think that uh, one of the things that Western people can, can learn from people of other cultures is that you don't do things on your own. So it really is important for Turkey to look at the pockets of where other people with a culture of mediation are. And Sadak and AU have actually gone to Ukraine and tried to talk to the parties there and to try and get them to understand that they can't continue doing what they're doing. And I think that Turkey can actually link into that new growth of the African angle. Because although I think we are still looked down upon, eventually people will understand that the African approach is one of, there is no quarrel which cannot be overcome. We really believe that every quarrel must end up in reconciliation. So um, what is here, as far as I can see, is that uh, Turkey has already done the moves and uh, already done what they can. But I really do believe that that Finland uh, connection, which we didn't know about, being now taken with the other things, gives Turkey a very unique position. And really it's the only country which is in that position. And that it really, from its history, it's always been where all the countries met. And um, um, I think this time they are called upon to put their best foot forward. Yeah, I think definitely there's a recurring theme that Turkey is the peacemaker in, yes. in not only the region but the world. It's yes. showing. Um, Mehmet Bey, now you own your own football club in Africa, Uganda, and I want to talk about something um, I like to call politics through sports. Um, some of our major global sporting tournaments, we see nations like Iran, who have sanctions, and Russia, you know, competing on a world stage with, you know, the other international, US, UK. Now, what do you feel, you know, putting politics aside, what do you feel competitive sports can teach politicians? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, uh, why we was in Uganda, why I why the team, why I'm president of uh, football team in Uganda? Because we was there uh, for United Nations projects with uh, for six hospital X-ray machines. And then of course uh, I lived there around two months. I was there and uh, of course we continue with uh, local people and we uh, we see their culture and we spend too much time together. And really, according to me, I think the most sympathetic people on the world live in Uganda. They are so hospitality, uh, so grateful people also. Uh, and 
when I have time, uh, I go some much weaker uh, because we don't work in the weekend time. And always I see uh, the people, they need, and these magic people, they need really hope. They need help and they, we, we have to do something for these people. We cannot only go there and we do our business, we come back. And I dream about that. Uh, I have to do some things, and I, uh, then I start the process, and we buy the team. Uh, what, what is the give the message for this team? Uh, according to my opinion, we are not only one football team in Uganda. We are more than one team. We give the great message to the world. Peace message. Work together. Be hope and open the way for the really who needed the way. And for that I'm so happy because we have our children football academy. After we buy the team is coming so uh, good uh, position and we make some interview with international channels also. We have some famous followers football players. And I don't know they communicate with me with from different many kinds, football player and manager. But always I say them, we don't buy Barcelona, this whole team, uh, third, third uh, uh, in, in Uganda, uh, third division team, but uh, of course when we buy, we make champion after one year. Sports does unite people across the world, that's something that's evident that we've seen. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, and then we actually we have to finish early because um, Dr. Frank is inviting us to the auditorium shortly. So. We, in 20 minutes. So we're going to ask Sedlan a question and then uh, we'll open up to our audience. Sedlan, you were in the government, so you obviously clearly understand foreign policy. Now I want to ask you to comment on Turkey's recent past efforts to diversify its foreign policy partnerships and alliances and how they've you know, used these to uh, impact um, global mediation. Um, thank you again. Uh, in business, actually, as we all know, there are uh, mottos, uh, even for the corporations. Uh, a sincere motto of uh, Turkey, uh, we hardly, uh, full-heartedly believe that, uh, peace at home, peace uh, in the world. This is the saying, this is the motto of our great uh, leader, and, I mean, every Turkish uh, child, uh, from the very early days, we, uh, we memorize this. So it is, you know, if you memorize enough, I mean, you can have a less, maybe a thousands, millions. Uh, I mean, it, is, uh, it becomes your automatic, uh, no matter from which uh, political side, doesn't matter, left, right, or center the common team of the Turkish politicians uh, in general. We believe in the, the peace uh, at home can only be achieved peace in the world, and peace in the world should be, is, should be aligned with peace at home. So, uh, whatever we do, I mean, uh, tr while trying to open the gate uh, further for business, for commerce, for export, import, uh, the, the common uh, motivation is to uh, um, keep the bridge or establish the bridge for peace. Because if you do good business together, and or if we understand each other through treason, it doesn't need to be export or import. Uh, or if we supply our primary needs, if the, the other party supply to us, that could be gas uh, pipeline, as in the case of Russia and the rest of the world, and, uh, or could be grain corridor, as I said. Uh, it is important to uh, to keep these lines are uh, open. So Turkey has been putting a real effort uh, for. Uh, all the neighbors uh, in general. I mean, uh, of course, it's not that uh, easy to achieve that. And also, I would like to emphasize uh, one uh, another issue. Uh, as we said, you know, the, if the problem is affecting all of us in this room, if just one of us, I mean, leaving aside the intelligence of these people or these people, if 
Hippodocos tries, tries to find a solution, we all, we all know very well that that solution will be in failure. It will not be superior. And also, it will be, it will be unfair because let's assume there is a worse thing coming to this, to this room and it will affect all of you, all of us. So that should be, uh, the, the microphone should be also on your, uh, should, should also listen to your uh, talks as well. So my point is, to cut it short, United Nations should be definitely made effective. It is not effective right now. I mean, uh, of course, the establishment and everything uh, is in, uh, in good intention, but the enforcement level is not uh, effective enough. So we cannot overcome uh, international problems through regional solutions. Of course, Turkey would do its best, her best, uh, and we uh, full-heartedly believe that, that way, because all of us, they are our neighbors to the south, to the north, doesn't matter. But uh, because of the level of the development of the human society, uh, all the technological information, all the wars and peace are, uh, whenever it happens, it can affect cross the world, uh, cross the nations. So we are risking uh, the whole world if we don't try to come up with international solution. And for a solution to be really powerful, it should have an enforcement power. So the United Nations should have an enforcement power. That could be climate change, that it should enforce real rules, because uh, 2050, at 2050, 2050, according to scientists, the whole, uh, whole uh, world population will be consuming three times of the Earth. We don't have three times of the Earth. We have just one Earth. So how can we solve this problem? I mean, the, the main issue, I mean, I'm really, uh, uh, I got really angry for this war, not only for humanitarian immediate impact, but the Earth is somehow suffering. In just 20 years time, in 20 year time, uh, there isn't a sustainability of the world. So why we are not concentrating on these issues? I mean, according to scientists, the recent finding says there, there, are, there is a uh, uh, uh, zombie uh, bacteria found in Siberian uh, seaside because of the climate uh, uh, warming underneath the ocean. So we just experienced just two years ago, we were almost, uh, all of us are to die. So, I mean, I, I can't believe it, you know, the, why United Nations or uh, all the, uh, another uh, name, I don't know, but currently we have United Nations. So it will take another uh, year or so to establish another one. But somehow it should be enforced. The second issue, I'm, I'm sure it's in the minds of almost every woman. I mean, I, I cannot dream. If women leaders, they were on this scheme, scene, I cannot think of this extreme number of wars throughout the world. I mean, look at the leaders. You know, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. That is, uh, uh, yeah. I'll yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, look at all, almost all the birds, almost all the leaders. I mean, uh, I'm not, uh, I, mean, I, I, I, uh, I want equal treatment for everyone. But, I mean, it, that can't be just coincidence. I mean, all the leaders in the fighting, they are men somehow. So let's ask the audience, do you think that if we had more women leaders, we would be you know, having, you know, avoiding wars. I just want to say, yeah. what would you do? Would there be the war Sorry. when... Would there be the war when all the men would be women of states? 
and all the men would be below. Or when the woman trainer would train the footballers of Uganda, would they pay differently? Yeah, but, but, but I would say the, the problems are extremely chaotic. Can I take it back? Uh, the problems are extremely chaotic. So you cannot solve these problems because they are all inclusive in us. You cannot solve these problems with one dimension. It is multi-dimensional right now. I mean, forget about the war. We all discuss in the, the, uh, the corporate world, corporate uh, governance. Why we discuss so far for the last 30 years? We discuss so many because we think that if you don't bring to the table, decision maker table, from the different parts of the uh, consumers, you cannot understand the consumer. It is extremely dynamic, the word it is, extremely chaotic, and it is multi-dimensional. So in order to sell more, I mean just uh, on purpose I am referring to business, in order to sell more, you need to better understand the audience. You need to better understand the every individual type of culture, diversity and so forth. Okay, I'd like to also give an opportunity. Okay, um, okay. So okay. 30 so seconds, 30 seconds. Just to cut it short. So why women would uh, different, uh, behave differently? Because, uh, I mean, it is uh, scientifically proven. It is, uh, I think, proven as well. Women are more collective. We are more, we, we need collective decision making. And women are more inclusive. I mean, earlier today, we discussed ESG uh, and uh, the social diversity and so forth. I mean, we need to put uh, different opinions to the table. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Sam. Sam, yeah, I'll keep it very brief. Uh, just let's go back to COVID days. Which other? Which all countries did better in handling COVID? Yeah. All countries led by women. From New Zealand to Taiwan, Indonesia, and you know, sure. if you come this side, Germany, Finland, you know, all of it. So, yeah, so we have the historical evidence. Back to our audience. Yeah. No, I didn't like to answer this one because. Of course. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, the microphone. You should always remember that Africa is very different because we've been with a very different history. And I just want to make two comments. The first one is that the colonial system, the slave system, was there to destroy families and destroy traditional patterns of behavior. The feminists adopted a code of sisterhood is powerful. That's an African practice where women in the home looked after the family and protected and enveloped their all with love, which is what we do now. I find that this whole thing about equality really does have a fault. What we want to have is equity, where there is justice, <coughs> and fairness for all. And because if you don't have that, you don't have peace. So I'm just saying, when you generalize, you should actually talk about Turkey. Um, I have a boy-child project to uh, partner the girl-child initiative. Because the UN program of the girl-child in Zimbabwe has unbalanced things to disadvantage the boy-child. I say so because of your sons, grandsons, and when they come from school, they are broken because the girl child has all these international things with all these things said about the men, which I've never seen. So um, I really think we should be very careful about generalizing because anytime people start to collectivize everything, it's really offensive uh, to people who have not experienced that. So uh, on, on uh, going forward, I think we need to together sit down and work out the values and principles that take the planet forward, united with justice and fairness for all as the principle. So I'm really sorry, but that's really a Thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Now we've only got five minutes left, so I would like to give an opportunity to the audience if anyone has any questions. Yes, 
Let me introduce to you our panelists, Haydin Uş, Deputy Mayor of Gaziantep Metropolitan University, a uh, municipality, I'm so sorry. Uh, Catherine Carlton, founder of Chief Executive Officer of Sapiens Impact USA. Rajiv Peshavaria, Chief Executive Officer of Stewardship Asia Center, Singapore. Emran Bayden, Vice General Director, Ivan Turkiye. Murat Seyit-Nepesov, Chairman of Internal Group Switzerland, and the Chair of the panel is Renita Kalhorn, Forbes Contributor and High EQ Leadership Coach from France. The floor is yours. You have about an hour. Thank you. And welcome, everyone. So first of all, I would like to share a few thanks. First of all, thank you to Frank, uh, again, for his Herculean efforts in bringing us all together. Thank you to the city of Gaziantep for warm welcome and hospitality and delicious food. And thank you to all of you for making such an effort to come here. I counted 50 countries uh, that were coming from uh, from as far as Uruguay and Korea. 
So it really shows the commitment you have to this topic and to the vision. So I'm going to tell our executive coach, and I specialize in working with impact tech founders, helping them and their teams level up as leaders. Because we need great leadership more than ever. The world is increasingly complex, volatile, and as we're seeing every week, brings new conflict, a new natural disaster. And so this plenary panel has incredibly diverse experience, both culturally, as well as across business, government, and academia. So we're going to uh, do our best to highlight the recommendations and initiatives that were discussed and explored over the past two days. That was 50 panels, over 300 panels. And what it will take for us to create impact with innovation, sustainability, and reconstruction. So we'll just start with a quick round to get a sense of what their takeaways and insights were from the panels that they attended. Uh, but I will do a quick introduction of the panel. So, so start with, um, how do you know? Um, uh, the deputy mayor of Chicago. And if you could share your insights from the past two days. Evet, öncelikle e, hazırlığına da saygıyla selamlıyorum. E, herkese e, katılımlarından ve katkılarından dolayı çok teşekkür ediyorum. İlkşehir Belediye Başkan Vekili Halil Uğur ben. E, özellikle iki günle ilgili e, düşüncelerime gelince e, Gaziantep e, yıllardan beri e, sanayi şehri olarak konuşuyordu. Sanayi şehri olarak konuşuyordu. E, Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanımız Sayın Fatma Şahin'in göreve gelmesiyle e, Gaziantep'in e, kültürel yapısı, kültürel dokusunun öne çıkarılması, yine gastronomiye e, verilen önem 500'den e, fazla e, ürünümüz, yemek çeşitimizin olması, hem Türkiye'den UNESCO tarafından gastronomi şehri olmamız, yine kültür yollarımızla e, Gaziantep e, özellikle Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanımızdan sonra 2014 yılından beri çok farklı başlıklarla anılmaya başladı. Ama ben buradan huzurlarınızda Frenk'e çok teşekkür ediyorum. Tüm hem Büyükşehir Belediye ekibimize 2000'den beri bunun geri planı var, mutfağı var. Aylardan beri çalışılan bir süreç. Buraya baktığımızda öyle bir noktaya geldi ki iki günden beri Gaziantep'te Horasız konuşuyor. İki günden beri Gaziantep'te ekonomik zirve konuşuyor. Bugün sanayiye gittiğimizde, bugün Gaziantep çarşısına buradaki misafirlerimiz, dışarıdan gelen misafirlerimiz mutlaka fark etmişlerdir. Çarşıda, esnafımızda, vatandaşta herkes orası konuşur hale geldi. Ee, neredeyse gastronomimizin, neredeyse kültürel etkinliklerimizin, kültürel yolumuzun daha fazla konuşur hale geldi. Bu da bizi mutlu kılıyor, bizi gururlandırıyor. Ee, hem Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanımızın gelecekle ilgili ortaya koymuş olduğu vizyon ee, hem de e, Gazi şehrin e, nasıl bir e, dünya şehri olduğunu e, iki günden beri yapılan etkinlikle ortaya koyduğunu görüyoruz. Zaten panel içerisinde de e, hem panelle ilgili hem de deprem sonrası Gazi şehrin nasıl bir kere daha e, düştüğü yerden ayak kalktığıyla ilgili süreci istişare edeceğiz diyorum. E, ben başka ülkelerden, başka şehirlerden gelen e, tüm katılımcılara katkı veren herkese Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanımız Sayın Fatma Şahin adına huzurlarınızda bir kez daha teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Thank you so much. Hoşçakalın. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Rajiv Keshawarya is the CEO of Stewardship Asia Center in Singapore and founder president of the Leadership Energy Consulting Company in Seattle, Washington. And previously he served as Chief Learning Officer of Coca-Cola, Morgan Stanley, helped found the Leadership Academy at Goldman Sachs. So he has this wealth of experience around leadership, is the author of several books on leadership, including a new one coming out uh, called Sustainable Sustainability. So what are some insights and takeaways you've had over the last two days? Thank you. Uh, for me, this last two days has all been about
finding profitable solutions to today's challenges like climate change and socioeconomic inequality. Uh, to do that, and what I learned in all these sessions, we need to do five things, and I took some notes. One, we need collaboration, not conflict. Two, we need to believe in interdependence, not self-interest. Three, we need innovation, innovation, and innovation, not business as usual. Four, we need to take a long-term view, not short-termism. And five, we need values-based action to maximize good, not regulation-based behavior to minimize bad. So, thank you. To, to sum up the conference, there are two quotes I picked up from the two sessions that I, from the many sessions that I attended for me, those stood out. One is, uh, in one of the sessions in the plenary, I think it was this morning, it was said that ESG is the moral compass of any company. And then in one of the uh, breakout sessions that I went to, a quote that struck with me was, if technology is created and deployed with good int intentionality, then the technology will deliver that int int intentionality for the betterment of humanity. So it's not the technology, it's the humans and the intentions in which they create the technology. So with that, uh, my two cents in terms of what I think is the solution, we need to upgrade ESL to e ES, we need to upgrade ESG to ESL, where L stands for leadership. Specifically, steward leadership, where we all think of ourselves as stewards of planet Earth and humanity. What is steward leadership? It is the genuine desire and persistence to create a collective better future for stakeholders, society, future generations, and the environment. We need to instill these values of steward leadership, and the answer lies in revamping our education system from schools, colleges, all the way through to corporations. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. I feel the same. I feel like it's the intentionality was a recurring theme in the past where technology is not necessarily good or bad, it's how it's used, and it's up to us as humans. So let's continue now, Catherine. Uh, Catherine Colton has diverse experience also across corporate, startups, and government affairs. She's worked in companies like Intel, founded and advised dozens of companies, mm -hmm. worked with state legislators in California, and for 12 years, until the end of 2020, I believe, was the mayor of Menlo California, which is known as the capital of venture capital. Uh, and interestingly, she's currently pursuing a PhD in Vanderbilt's um, in Microsoft. So clearly, you're a forever student, forever learning. And what are some insights that you would like to share? I, I did a similar thing. I took notes. Um, I saw one. Is that um, I, I similarly took notes on what were the, the themes that were coming up again and again. And we talked about AI. And the, the takeaway I, I heard people saying about AI, AI is a tool. Uh, it's not necessarily inherently good or bad. It's like a hammer. I can beat you over the head. I can build you a house. It's something that we have to manage for good or bad. Uh, sustainability uh, reminds me of the quote, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. And there's, there's a Maslow's triangle that comes up with sustainability and, and pulling that together. And in doing so, inclusion was one of the big words I heard again and again. And inclusion not only for male, female, people of different eth ethnicities, but young people as well as, as older people. And one of the interesting things I heard today was someone saying, hire a young person between the age of maybe 25 to 35 to hack your company's strategy. Because if you don't hire them to help you hack your strategy, they'll be doing it for themselves or for someone else. So bring people in and bring people in that will challenge you. And that generational shift, one of the things that really struck me you know, in, in all the crazy things happening in the world today, I felt it was pretty positive. People are pulling together and working and, and keeping the great and what are we going to do about it kind of attitude. And, and in doing that, I see people here that are entrepreneurs. I see people here that are government. Uh, academia, VCs, but they tend to operate in silos. And uh, one of the beautiful things about Paresis is being able to facilitate us working together and communicating uh, better. And in doing that, we talked about compassion, transparency, and trust. And we have to grasp the fact that in today's society, zero sum game doesn't work anymore. Uh, binary, black and white, 
just doesn't work. It's creative gray. It's working together. It's a uh, balance of uh, polar polarities. Uh, someone talked about uh, dynamic tension and embracing that and working together. And um, a lot of that comes through when we talked about uh, the inflation. They raised their hand and said, how many people are critically worried about inflation? And a few people raised their hand. And they said, how many people are worried about geopolitics? A lot of people raised their hand. And absolutely, completely, sustainability, uh, the climate crisis is definitely something we need to worry about and factor into our business on a, on a daily basis. However, if there's a nuclear war, we're not going to worry as much about sea level rise. So we need to also make sure that we have the communication going and it really comes down to relationships. That's, that's the key word, I think, for my takeaway from the last two days. That's a great summary. Thank you. And I would um, echo, you're also echoing what Rajiv said about it's not business as usual. Right? We can't just expect to do the same thing without changing the way we do business. So, so thank you for that. Uh, Fahim, let's uh, hear from you. Fahim Hashim is former Minister for Telecommunication and Information Technology in Afghanistan and one of its leading entrepreneurs. In 2005, he launched what uh, is one of the largest logistics companies in Afghanistan. In 2010, he launched One TV, which became Afghanistan's largest TV network and is part of the machine group, an Afghan conglomerate with interest in fuel logistics, manufacturing, airlines, trading, and construction. What are your, your tech takeaways? Um, ladies and uh, gentlemen, it's such an honor to be here in this beautiful city of Gaziantep, which embodies resilience and courage. And you already see Gaziantep moving after the earthquake. It's also um, great to see Frank and his team orchestrating such a wonderful event where leaders from all walks of life, from politics to business, have come together to talk about some of the challenges that we all face together. My first takeaway from this meeting is that we still have the opportunity to work together and to tackle some of the problems that we all together as humans face. And my second takeaway is that we all share the same thing as humanity. What we need to think about right now is, do we have the means? Do we have the tools? to tackle these problems together. And I think the answer is, and I'm going to focus more on the digital part, not the technology, but the digital transformation, which defines as setting a new vision. So the first thing I'd like to recommend, or my takeaway, is that we all need to work together to define a vision for ourselves, which could be a better world, which could be a safer world, which could be a united world for ourselves, for our children, and for our children of truth. Once we set that vision, then we need to work together to see how we can achieve that vision. And of course, we need to set the goals. Because without a clear vision and without defining goals, I think that we're going to continue to discuss, but we will never get to reach that vision. So I believe that that vision exists. The best way to do to reach that vision is to transform the way we think, to transform the way we do things. And technology can play a major role there. And of course, when you talk about technology, it's not only technology, it's the digital transformation, where 70% of it is people and leadership and management and human being, whether those are people who accept the change and the way we do things, or people who do the project. So 20% is technology and 10% is algorithm. So let's connect, let's communicate, let's work together to build those platforms that can help us connect each other faster, that can help us to use the data, to share the data in a responsible way, to impact the decision making in our governments, to communicate to each other for our own future, and to make sure that we're not left out of the decision making, and to make sure that we get the right data in the right time. So digital transformation can play a major role and I see this room full of uh, both political as well as business leaders that can work together to make that happen. My recommendation for Gaziantep specifically 
would be to become a digital leader, to not only digitalize their own government services, to not only create the right ecosystem for ICT investments, but also trying to in, uh, create that ecosystem that helps them uh, develop an ICT industry. They can become the leader and they can become that city that can create solutions for other cities as well as other countries. I see that talent here, I see that willingness, and I think as they are reconstructing, they can invest in digital skills, in digital infrastructure, as well as create a vision of their own, create a team of their own, and then become the number one city in Turkey for providing, not only being the digital government uh, province, but also providing digital services as well. Okay. And next, we'll hear from Murat, a site in web user, chairman of the Integral Group of companies encompassing Switzerland, Great Britain, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, and the stands, uh, I won't name them all, uh, which include one of the largest exporters and logistics providers of crude oil and petroleum products from the Caspian region, as well as a trading and logistics company specializing in non oil commodities. So you're covering the whole spectrum now, aren't you? What are, what are some takeaways that you would like to share with us about? Great. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, I'm very happy that we are all here together in the beautiful city of Gaziantep, uh, despite the COVID, and this is the first for us a global meeting of the COVID pandemic, and uh, Frank and Christine, and really heroic efforts to do this. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful. And, uh, now we are back. For us, this community is back. For us, this global meeting is back. And now we are all together to unite our force, forces uh, to do something good for this uh, world. And uh, uh, just one small comment here. I was invited to the businessman, but I'm here mainly as the president of the Great Caspian Association. Uh, this is an association for promotion and development. And uh, Turkey is an uh, integral part of the region. That's why we also live it like this. Uh, now, uh, the takeaways. Uh, we had uh, more than 50 sessions, and uh, I participated uh, in some of them because it was impossible, unfortunately, to cover physically even all of them. Uh, and uh, uh, the main thing, uh, the main idea is everything is possible in this world, and all together we can do a lot of things uh, which we cannot do alone. And, uh, uh, and uh, all of us would like to make this world better, and uh, there are a lot of ways, and somebody try to do this through the business, very good. Somebody try to do this via digitalization, it's so great. Uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, what was not discussed at the really deeply, the, uh, unfortunately, is geopolitics. Because uh, uh, today we have the situation that there are two conflicts uh, which would really ruin our world. And then, uh, we should concentrate, all of us, even the business community. I understand that uh, it's probably mainly the task of international organizations, but unfortunately, the organizations are not showing a proper performance. And uh, there are good initiatives from the from the side of Turkey. Uh, we saw the peacemaking efforts uh, from the president of Turkey, also the Grain Corridor, Grain Deal, uh, which is very important for the food security of the world. Uh, but I think uh, everybody, even from the Thoracic community, and Thoracic community became enough strong to give the recommendations for the business community, but also for the government, for the various countries, uh, here, more than 50 countries. And uh, uh, first priority, in my view, it should be to solve these two geopolitical problems. Uh, and without this, uh, and these problems, if we will not solve them now, we will deteriorate and we will have a very short term perspective for the future. Huge destruction of this world. And then uh, it's very important the climate change issues, ESG, digitalization, but in my view, this is the second priority for the world. Uh, now, uh, we've heard a very inspiring speech of Minister Shinshek about the uh, Turkey, the today's situation, and uh, I'm happy that there is a clear plan how to develop the economy. And uh, after this uh, speech, I was really thinking okay, what I can do in Turkey, how can I invest in Turkey? Uh, this is a really uh, this is a really good news, and uh, uh, Turkey now the geopolitical level and uh, uh, has a very strong presence and very strong impact. Uh, and now just a little bit, bit 
develop the economy and it is also perfectly doable. Uh, now, uh, recommendations. Uh, I have met here several really brilliant young people in the Horasis community, first time. And then I think that uh, we need to create, uh, I will not say young global leader, I will rather say future global leader, leaders community inside Horasis, and some people are here in the room. Uh, and we should help these people uh, who, who could be really the uh, best of the best politicians in their companies or best business leaders uh, to develop what they can develop. Uh, uh, this is one. And the second recommendation is uh, I believe we need to create inside for us a permanent think tank. Uh, because a lot of ideas were, were discussed, a lot of solutions were proposed. Uh, but now we need uh, to do systematization of this. And then, of course, it's very difficult to do during the one or two days uh, events. No methods for us in global teams are really doing other events. That's why I think there should be at least a small group of, of, from the Russian community who, who should permanently do this uh, day to day. And then on the, each uh, next meeting to uh, provide and produce the results. We were discussing several times with uh, Frank about uh, doing the declarations. Uh, which is good. Uh, I think this also we need to implement regularly, but think time probably will be the good possibility. And then uh, all the lot of sessions are on the chat room, uh, maybe not here, but from the other events. Uh, but the uh, uh, results of the, uh, the documents from our think tank should be accessible to everyone. And uh, uh, I will probably also later on give you some very nice story about how business and the charity organization organizations could solve not the geopolitical but regional problems. Uh, but uh, what I believe, uh, everything is possible in this world, and let's join together our, our forces to identify the problems and try to solve them. Starting from geopolitics and going to the economy, uh, going to the logistics, going to digitalization, all, all part of our activities. Thank you. Thank you, Marat. It's true, when you think about all the brain power that we have in Horasis, in terms of knowledge, experience, cultural, we should really be leveraging that in a think tank format. Uh, we have a, a special guest, um, Emra Ibnir, who is an expert in new construction building. Uh, you're, uh, you're Deputy Director General of Green Bank. So why don't you share a few thoughts on new construction and recommendations? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to deliver my special text to Her Excellency Ms. Patma Shahi uh, and Mr. Frank uh, for what a nice summit that we can have advantage and opportunities to make impact on our community in Gaza. This is very important. The topic is impact and now we are making impact on our community, what we will do together. Actually, Ilban is a national construction and development bank and only responsible for serving to local authorities and municipalities. We are a affiliated institution of Ministry of Environment, so if we are talking about sustainable urban development, we are at the center and as Ilban we are bridge between international institutions and the local authorities. Actually, <clears throat> we faced a very devastating earthquake, actually, all of you know. And after the earthquake, we are talking how we reconstruct these things. But this kind of summits like Horizons and Horizons Community can achieve one thing. We can do everything <coughs> before earthquakes. We are responsible for risk mitigation, not adaptation. After earthquake, it's very easy. You can find finance and you can easily reconstruct these <laughs> buildings and provide economic mission for both companies. <coughs> but before earthquake, we have to do something. Not earthquake, we have faced a lot of disaster. Actually, after pandemic, maybe uh, there are some advantages of this pandemic, COVID-19. Before pandemic, we think that all problems anywhere in the world, uh, they are their problems. They have to solve that. 
But after pandemic, we realize that like climate change, like this kind of pandemics and disasters, we have to combat all together all in order to overcome this kind of problems. If we decrease the carbon emissions in Turkey, this doesn't make any sense to all world. All countries have to do this. This is very important. All panelists emphasize the importance of working together. Really, it's very important that all world human beings, we have to work together and transfer our knowledge to each other. As in that, what we will do shortly in earthquake area, we have some item topics, very famous in recent years, actually, combating climate change, disaster risk management, sustainable development goals, drought, a lot of politicians say a lot of topics. But do you think that do these talkings by politicians make impact on both communities? We face a lot of problems. So the answer is no. So we have to do different things to make impact on communities to overcome these problems. Yes, as in back, together with municipalities in this region, we'll start, uh, we have already started, but we'll continue next year uh, to reconstruct a lot of infrastructure, urban projects, and uh, housing projects for our citizens of communities. When I first hear about Horizon Community that takes place in Gaziantep, first I was surprised. Secondly, what a nice sound that in an earthquake area and in a, this kind of conference center, we feel very confident and we uh, deliver our speakings. This means we can create, we can create re resilient buildings, resilient place, and uh, this is a good sample and we can organize a meeting summit uh, all together. As in bank, financing the municipalities or finding any uh, finance from outside from World Bank or any other financial financing institutions is a work duty that we have to do. But the most important thing to transfer knowledge, know-how and the best practice all over the world. This is very important. That's why we have to work together. Uh, this is impact and we create all together. Thank you very much. Yes, really that's the thing, isn't it? So now I would like to have the panelists share some stories. They have some fascinating stories uh, from their experience about reconstruction, rebuilding, that I hope will inspire you and give you ideas for the possibility in your own situation. So, Virginie, let's go back to you. Uh, as you mentioned, you're a great component of steward leadership. Uh, so, why is it so relevant to the challenges we face in reconstruction and sustainability? And do you have a story that kind of illustrates its power? Sure. So why is steward leadership important? Again, steward leadership is the genuine desire and persistence to create a collective better future for stakeholders, society, future generations, and the environment, not just for the shareholders. Right? So why is it important? Because if you ask yourself, what is the biggest lesson that COVID-19 taught us? It is that no one is safe until everyone is safe, right? So this world today that we live in is hugely interconnected and interdependent. And as every panelist and every session has emphasized in this conference, we need to work together to defeat today's existential challenges. That is why the idea of creating a collective better future. That's why we need school leadership. Now, school leadership involves playing with, uh, leading your life, your business, your government work, whatever it is, with four values. Interdependence, the belief that the more I help the world, the more the world will help me. The more I give, the more I give. Long-term view, taking a long-term view. There may be some short-term costs, but in the long-term, if I think long-term, we are going to be successful. Ownership mentality, taking ownership for today's problems. 
We will solve them. I will solve them. And finally, creative resilience, which is innovation, innovation, innovation, and never giving up until you find the innovation. So those are the four values. Now, a story of Stuart Leaders. One of many stories, but I'll share one. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, a sprawling uh, acres and acres of hilly uh, mountains with a lush green forest. 30 years ago, this place called the Golden Triangle, which is the border, which is the uh, border of Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand, was lush green hills, beautiful forests. Uh, but then, uh, independent militia, heavily armed independent militia took over, and they destroyed the forest, and it became scorched earth. Uh, they were armed, they were not controlled by any government, so the only thing they wanted to do was grow opium and run prostitution business. So now this one slush green forest area of the villages around these, this golden triangle is now a haven for opium and drug production and is a haven for prostitution. There is no other profession. There are no schools nearby. There are no hospitals nearby. So if you fall sick, the only medicine is opium. So it's also giving you huge amounts of addiction issues. Right? If you wanted to make a living, your only choice was getting to the drug trade or getting to prostitution. Life was horrible beyond imagination. 30 years ago, one, one day, the Thai princess mother arrived. She looked, she came in the chop by the chopper on the top of one of the hills and said to her team, uh, no, this cannot be it. We need to reimagine a different future for this place. And she challenged her team to change the face of this place. Today, you go to the Golden Triangle, you will find that the Scotch earth is reforested again. Beautiful lush green forest all the way. No more opium production, no more prostitution. And the same impoverished villagers who were uh, subdued and beaten up to those things are owners of five very successful community-owned businesses. They produce excellent single origin coffee. They produce excellent macadamia nuts. They produce garments. They produce fabrics and tourism. In fact, their product, products are sold in brands like IKEA, Muji, and many other international chains. They employ the best Italian designers to design the, the, the garments. In many airports, airports, you can see the shops. They're called Doitum. So the region is called the Doitum region. What I'm describing is the Deutung Development Project. Excellent, excellent story of collective good. And these are community-owned businesses, hugely profitable. So the idea here is that you have to find profitable solutions to today's challenges. It's an amazing story. If anybody hasn't been there, I urge you to go there for a tourist trip. In fact, they are also, by the way, a sixth thing. They are now a living laboratory of circular economy. They, they run, uh, uh, you go there and you will learn uh, what circular economy is all about. We think of recycling in terms of three or four different bins. They recycle at 37 points. They are teaching the whole world what sustainability is, what circular economy is, besides having paid to buy hugely profitable community owned businesses. Mm -hmm. So that would be the story I would share. And I would agree with you that, you know, we together, if we join hands and if we Imagine a collective better future. We humans can do amazing things, but we have to get over narrow self-interest. We have to get over conflict and get into real collaboration. <laughs> That's the point. That's the point, is getting over that narrow self-interest, because no one person could have accomplished that by themselves. It was really a group effort. Thank you for that story. Um, Murat, we'll come back to you in a minute. But um, why don't you share with us, uh, as the Minister uh, for Telecom, te telecom me, Telecommunication and Information Technology, you were given an ambitious mandate also to spearhead digital transformation in Afghanistan. And it wasn't just about upgrading the legacy infrastructure, right? It would be pretty easy just to go in and change the technology. But you also had to deal with changing mindsets and people's behaviors and attitudes towards change. Can you give us a sense of where you started and where you ended up? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we, when I was uh, first uh, appointed as the minister, I did not have IT background. And one of the reasons they brought me in was because I did not understand IT. Uh, because the previous ministers focused only on 
algorithms, technology, computers, and equipment. And the problem was not with computers, because computers are always created in a good quality, in a, in a good way, and computers can function if you have the right people using them and if you use them the right way. So the first thing I needed to do was to uh, define a vision. What is trans digital transformation? Why do we need digital transformation? When I'm saying digital transformation, I'm not talking about IT. I'm not talking about digital infrastructure only. I'm talking about why are we not performing well? Why are we not able to reduce corruption? Why are we not able to provide services to the uh, citizens of this country? Why are we not able to reuse that data in a responsible way? Why are we not effective? Why are we not working together? Why are we fighting over an election for one or two years? Why can we not ensure transparency? I mean, there were so many problems that, that I could miss. And then I spoke to the president and he said, I'm, I'm bringing you in to uh, reform this sector. I said, I'm not going to reform the sector. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a vision for better governance. And I'm going to create a vision for an information society. And unless we have an information society and knowledge-based economy and a digital government, you cannot do anything in any ministry. So that effort included every ministry, not just my own ministry. For instance, e-medicine, -E for instance, e -Hajj, or um, or digital ID that, that we had to uh, create and people were then registered and they finally had their identities registered or uh, the first uh, for the first time we were able to create a digital uh, uh, driving license and all of these things happened in just a matter of maybe a year and a half so it was a very high speed decision but the first thing I did was I created this vision and then I created the national digital agenda and that's exactly what we need to do here we need a global agenda for a future uh, a better future and then after that I went and spoke to the president and this is but this is the most important part. You need digital vision to be supported by the digital leaders. And if you do not have the leader's support, then you're not going to be able to move politically and economically. When I got his support, then I was able to create the relevant strategies and everything else. And we started you know, digitalizing a lot of government services. Um, we reduced the corruption um, a lot. Of course, it was not totally eliminated. But wherever we implemented digitalization and digital transformation, the corruption reduced. The coordination got much better. For the first time after 15 years, I was able to pass the e-signature and e-transaction law. For the first time in the country, after um, 15 years of work, in 2018, we were able to pass the law uh, so that emails were officialized and you could actually email and that could work as a contract. Uh, but more importantly, coordination increased and we were able to register people. We were able to identify two, three hundred thousand, uh, you know, um, um, Government employees that did not exist time. So we saved a lot of money, we saved a lot of things. Now, the reason I'm saying this uh, is that unless we define a vision, unless we define a strategy, unless we de redefine the way we do things, I think, and use the tools that we have at our hands, I think it's going to be very difficult to achieve any goal. The last thing I would like to mention is that um, we created the right ecosystem. Of course, the is not in the, in, in the best condition right now, but even the current government is using those. We attracted a lot of investment into um, a country like Afghanistan because the investors were confident that we could actually um, uh, protect their investment. So, um, the, the, the last thing that, that I was going to say was we created the right uh, team, and that's the key thing. You know, just like uh, Murat was saying, we need these structures, um, these agile, bionic, flat structures where we can communicate with each other faster. We had the first ministry ever created in a government that uh, where we had accepted a bionic and a flat structure. In a typical government, if you go down, you have 15, 20 different layers. But in our, in our ministry, we only have four different layers. The ministers, the deputy, and the directors, we have digital officers, we have chief digital officers, we have CIOs, and then team, uh, teams of five or ten experts. So the layers were not that much, and we could do that by changing legis legislation and created a digital ministry. Now, what I'm thinking for Brazil said as that since they're very committed, they could have their own digital office, they could have their own digital leader, they could have their own digital officer, through which they will then be able to use technology to create an environment for investment, an ecosystem for investment, to prevent, the, or not, not to prevent, but at least uh, be aware of all of the natural disasters and stuff that they could uh, anticipate. Anyways, I'm not going to be very detailed, but in a country like Afghanistan, we were able to achieve so much by using digital technologies, by accepting the fact that we have to change, that we 
the way we did. And had we started this earlier, we would have not been in a mess that we are today because hundreds of billions of dollars were wasted because the information was not accessible, people were working in silos, there was no transparency, no efficiency. Had we done this earlier, we would have been much ahead of where we are right now, but I'm glad we still did it. And that was an experience that you know proved that technology can really help uh, become efficient, more effective, and work towards a better and a united future. Thank you for that. I think that is an example. You know, when you take technology to a place that's already fairly developed, it's less impressive to see their progress. But when you take it to somewhere, I think you told me there were 22 million people now out of the 34 million population that now have access to internet that may not have had it before. So that there's an exponential value there that you create. Well, absolutely. The best thing we could do was to. Um, um, to invest in accessible and affordable internet. And that's why during COVID we were able to uh, provide free education to um, all of the Afghans around the country. And of course, thanks to Telcos, we used their technology called Nixa, the, the internet traffic, where uh, people were able to download the teaching material for free. Even now that the girls are not allowed to go to school, they're still able to use that system and download educational material wherever they are. When you inform people, when you give people access to internet, they can then access the information they would, they would like to read. They will then access the information that they can use to make decisions about their own lives. And uh, we were also able to, digital, uh, to develop a digital economy. I mean, not only digitalize our own economy, of course it's not a, in a very large scale, but we were able to, by creating demand in the market, by creating more service, digital services, we were able to reduce the internet cost almost um, from, from $5 per uh, GD to 30 cents per GD in a matter of just two or three years. The internet costs came down rapidly because more people started using it. The competition grew. So I think the more demand you create, the more you use internet and digital services, the more competitive the prices will become, the more people will be involved and engaged and informed. Internet now is like oxygen. But anyways, internet was an issue there, it's not here. Uh, the bottom line is, Digitalization, digital transformation is not about technology. Let's use technology to connect better, to stay connected, to stay informed, to make better decisions uh, for the future, and it could be useful for anything. So that my, my example wasn't totally the best example of the world, but we did a lot in a country like Afghanistan. We had all people, you know, watching um, content on his iPhone, um, uh, when um, you know, after so many years, and making decisions in the morning after. Uh, so many disastrous years uh, in, in that country. And I believe that was an achievement. Thank you. Oh, it's definitely an achievement. Uh, so now let's go to the other side of the world, maybe another extreme, to California, Silicon Valley, with maybe the most tech savvy people in the world. Uh, Catherine, so you were mayor of uh, Menlo Park during a decade of exponential change in the world and, and the, in the U.S. in particular, with mobile technology, with social media, civil unrest, climate change. So maybe you could share a specific story of an accomplishment that um, maybe represents reconstruction and possibility, something you're proud of during that period. Sure. Um, I think one of the key things to point out is, as Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum talks about the fact that we're now in the fourth industrial revolution. And I don't know how many of you have heard that or know what it is. It's basically saying we're moving out of the age of data and into the age of systems. It's all like clockwork. If you move one area, it has knock-on effects in other areas now as well. The, the whole butterfly effect thing is, is reality, but we were talking earlier, we now, we now have 8 billion butterflies. And keeping track of that is tremendous. And one of the key things in this is, as we talk about trust, there, there are three aspects of trust. There's the trust in businesses, and we know that businesses in the higher quartiles of trust have half the turnover, they're more profitable, they're more stable. And then the, on the personal level, people working in businesses that have high levels of trust, those people uh, are psychologically happier. That spills into their, uh, people that say they're happy at work actually then report that they're happier in their marriage and with their family. And that factors into their health. If you're working in a higher trust environment, you actually have a better chance of surviving cancer and having uh, better ability to manage uh, diseases such as diabetes and uh, heart disease. It has a huge effect that then spills over into communities. Communities at higher levels of trust 
uh, people report being happier with the standard of living, but it goes all the way up to uh, the country level. Countries, for every standard deviation of trust that a country goes up, on average, the SME gets $2.3 million in investment more. So the trust in the individual, the trust in uh, the corporations, the trust in communities, all impact each other. And it's very difficult sometimes uh, to get those communication going that we're talking about because I don't think industry fully appreciates the amount of pressure, the different types of pressures that politicians have, for example. And that's completely different in academia, which trust me, from what I've seen in academia, it's its own level of politics as well. And one of the interesting examples of that coming together is um, we as mayors in Silicon Valley, you, you think that we know a lot about tech, but you know, a lot of us are, are lawyers and come from different backgrounds, and nobody likes to admit what you don't really understand. We were voting on uh, 3G tech, uh, 5G technology, and I realized a lot of people didn't know. So we had a closed session, chat of house rules. We get all the experts in and maybe some Stanford people and talk about, you can ask all the embarrassing questions so that you really begin to understand this technology. And people love that. They love that safety of have, not being able to be quoted and, and really being able to understand better the technology behind some of the decisions that they were having to make. And they liked it so much, we had a couple more. And then David Pine, who's a county board supervisor for San Mateo, uh, knew about electricity. And so I said, David, you know, would you like to sponsor some? That worked out so well, we learned about community choice aggregators. And I don't know how many of you have heard about uh, PG&E is our electric company that seems to be uh, burning down California. And not terribly popular. So we found out that we could actually fire them and create our own electric company, which we did, Peninsula Clean Energy. And it all started with us learning about what the technology was available for clean energy. And we got a big round table and we had advocates, we had academics, we had people from corporations, and we had elected officials all sitting around as equals, learning and bringing in experts and finding out, could we actually do this? Is there enough energy for us to buy? The end result, long story short, Peninsula Clean Energy now provides 100% greenhouse gas free electricity to over a million people in Silicon Valley at 5% less than what pg e charges, showing that you don't have to pay more to do what's good for the society, good for the world. And because we're not paying the, the high salaries, we were actually making an embarrassing amount of profits on top of this. So then we started programs where we were giving electric bikes away to students that had been pre-qualified for free reduced price lunch. So we knew that they, they needed that help. Um, being able to help people make the right choices for greening their house, for their, for their uh, kitchen upgrades that were more sustainable, so that it became cyclical in terms of doing what was right for the community uh, on, an, on the green level. And uh, all of this came from us having a safe space to be able to learn and talk about what was actually happening and what was actually capable of happening. So remember, um, Sometimes you can't have the uncomfortable conversations learning publicly. Sometimes you have to meet privately. There are all kinds of ways that you can get together to do it. But it is critical to have the conversations and get to know each other and build those relationships where you can learn from each other and bounce ideas and create new things like Peninsula Clean Energy, which has been a huge success. And we, I'm proud to say it's been a model now for San Francisco doing the same in San Jose and other counties around California. Thank you for that, Catherine. It's true that, um, I don't know if there's studies around it, but um, most people, when they go to work, they have two jobs. One is doing their job, and one is, is making sure that people don't find out you know, their mistakes and what they don't know, and they don't feel safe often to ask questions. So I love that when you give them a, a safe space, it creates a virtuous circle, cycle, that just kept generating more solutions. Wonderful. Um, let's come back to you now, Murat. Murat, you have a, an amazing story about how business uh, can be a force for good. Could you share that story? Yes, I will tell you one interesting story which recently happened in our region. Uh, 
their business together with the charity organizations to solve the regional issues which uh, no international organization, no governments of the countries were able to solve. And uh, I'm talking about the Central Asia. We know that Central Asia is a landlocked region. And uh, it's very difficult uh, to move uh, various cargoes from the region to the world market, from the world market to the region. And uh, there are several kinds of crowds which are going from the region. Uh, one which was traditionally used was going by Russia. Then the uh, war started with Russia and Ukraine. And suddenly it became very problematic because of sanctions, banks, and the regulations, and also not very safe. Uh, of course, uh, businessmen, they started to move cargo from the other available route, which was Azerbaijan, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, so called East-West Corridor. <coughs> Immediately, this route became congested, uh, a lot of bottlenecks, uh, big delays, up to several months delays to move your cargo, and uh, which became completely unsustainable. And then, uh, there is another route, which is going through Iran, also sanctions, also problems, regulations, and so on. And then, uh, People re recalled about the fourth route, which is going through Afghanistan. And uh, in Afghanistan, just before uh, in September 21, uh, there was a change of uh, government. And then a new, a new people came, the Taliban regime, uh, which was uh, not internationally recognized. And then uh, uh, for the world community, Afghanistan became the black hole, the territory nobody would like to touch. In reality, Afghanistan, like a country, like ge geographically, is not sanctioned. The problem is that only if you are dealing with the urban people in the new regime. And then, uh, this was a good opportunity, and of course, business people started to think, why not to move to, to Afghanistan, to the nice ports in Pakistan, like the Karachi ports, deep sea ports, with access to the Indian Ocean, and then worldwide. Uh, the question was how to do this, because no, nobody would like at that time at least to go to Afghanistan and discuss with the new regime about some business and so on. And then uh, there is a charity foundation in Zurich called the Eurasia Heart Foundation. They are, they are doing cardiac surgery for children free of charge in our region, the Caspian region, and they were invited together with Red Cross to go and to do surgery in Kabul in Afghanistan. They came there. Uh, they were provided with a hospital, they started to do surgery uh, for the children. Uh, very soon, there was a queue of 60,000 children for the cardiac surgery in Afghanistan. Today, this queue is 200,000 children. And uh, the problem of this, if uh, you will not do in time this operation for the child, the child could just die, it could not develop properly. Uh, and uh, then, the so-called Minister of Health of the new regime, they thought, okay, what we can do for you? Uh, how we can expand this operation? Because uh, one mission, could, they could do like 50 to 100 operations. They couldn't do 1,000, they couldn't do 10,000. And the question was uh, how to do this, uh, how to scale it. Uh, and then uh, these doctors <laughs> contacted us and asked what, how, what we should reply. And we told them, as a, our association members, okay, ask from the Taliban regime, can they provide the security of transit mm -hmm. of the cargoes from the region? And uh, for, the, uh, for, for the government uh, of Afghanistan, it was just, they just doing nothing, anyhow security is there. In Afghanistan is now a very secure country. Uh, like, you can really cross the country and look at the Before, uh, like three, four years ago, there was more than 20 different groups and uh, military commanders and uh, tribes, and you should deal with all of them. Now we just deal with only with one, uh, with one person in the, in, in the government. Uh, and, uh, and suddenly they started working. Uh, and now, just we need to scale this as much as possible because of 200,000 children in the queue. The self cost of one operation in Afghanistan through this uh, scheme is $1,000. One life, $1,000. To do this surgery in some in Switzerland will cost you hundred thousand dollars plus for this hundred times more. And uh, and this is uh, and then slowly slowly this uh, scheme started to work and start uh, started to scale. And then what I'm saying here that uh, and before that there was a United Nations, other uh, United Nations agency. They tried to solve this issue without success. Uh, then there were governments of the region like Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, they also need Afghanistan in the transit country. They tried but didn't work. And suddenly this worked because of their force. Again, the professors of medicine, the surgeons, because of some business people, uh, and because of uh, kind of goodwill of the government of the existing government of Afghanistan. And what I'm trying to say that 
you see everything is possible and uh, let's try to find such problems and try to solve them using what we have in our hands and uh, and for us is, as organization is a really great uh, uh, bringing really great opportunities we have more than several thousand people in the Horasis community Horasis network various government officials and national organizations with some people here uh, we have businessmen we have uh, university professors, uh, we have even medical doctors. I met with one professor, he is also doing free of charge surgery in the region, and now I'm going to invite him to do this in Afghanistan. And uh, let's try to formulate and uh, uh, identify the problems, and try, uh, let's try to solve them together. This was my message. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So that story doesn't illustrate what's possible. I don't know what story will. I mean, would you want to be the one going to the Taliban to negotiate safe passage? But I think it was the Swiss surgeons themselves who went to negotiate, and they were so driven, they had such a clear vision, that I think it must have overridden the, any fear they might have had. Yes, and their goal and their task was to scale the, the, the operations because they, they saw the children. They wanted to save lives. And they wanted to help. And how to help, of course, everybody has limited budgets. Everything is very difficult. And here there is a unique possibility. Solving logistic connectivity problem of the region, saving children life, and at the same time, uh, if transit will start flowing, uh, there will be a lot of jobs created in Afghanistan wow. for the truck drivers, for the people, for, for the transshipments, and so on. And, so on. and uh, without, let's say, paying money to the relevant people to the sanctions and so on, in, in, in the government. And, uh, and then uh, when I'm saying this story to, on, the various, uh, on the various meetings and uh, people just don't believe it, how it's possible, but mm -hmm. this was perfectly possible. Let's do this together it's in some wow. other places of the world. Excellent. Well, I think that's a good place to pause. I want to thank all panelists for your contributions, your thoughts, your thinking. And I thought I would end with a quick quote from Fatih Sultan Mehmet, who was a sultan in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, he was one that reconquered Istanbul. He said, it's necessary to try the impossible to see the limitations of the possibility. And I think all of your stories have really illustrated how far we can take the possibility. So thank you, and thank you to the audience. Thank you very much, and I'm so, much and I'm so sorry that I have forgotten to announce your name. I'm sure all of our participants know him very well, but I just want to uh, repeat it. One of our, of course, uh, panelists was uh, Fahim Hashimi. He is the president of Hashimi Group and former Minister of Communication and Information Technology of Afghanistan. And with this discussion, thank you very much. We have come to the end of our panels uh, of our SS uh, Global Meetings. Thank you very much. I am looking for Frank, actually. Uh, who has brought us together for this significant organization and the floor is yours. Thank you. What a wonderful panel. <laughs> what a wonderful panel and thanks Munita for, for sharing it. A lot of inspiration and I think as you mentioned in all your stories and all the narratives, we have to work together. We have to join hands and also give up our selfish behavior. I think we really have to work in the global public interest. Uh, and that's, I think, what you all said. Uh, it's a great summary, bringing really, uh, all of you. So, big applause to you, all of you panelists. <laughs> Just a quick um, housekeeping announcement. The buses are waiting outside, bringing us to the dinner location. But before we go, I would like to invite everybody to come to the stage for a photo, for a family photo. So, please join us on the stage with the panelists. Tamam tamam bekliyoruz zaten daha hazırlanıyoruz.
Pardon, sorry. Şey biraz sağ tarafa alabilir miyiz ya? Aynen. Kim söyleyecek? Az bir şey sol taraftan sağ tarafa alabilirsek çok iyi olur. Tam ortalı olsun diye. Yoksa bu fotoğraf çok saçma. Şey, moment. Herkes böyle. Okay. Ama kayıttan çıkar. Öyle 